just before I introduce the first reader, I just want to give a bit of background information for the um, actual scholars opportunity. The what 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 are we doing here? <laughs> um, so this is our first year of recognizing Anthony Vaznesso scholars in fiction. Um, for those of you who don't know, Anthony uh, was an incredible writer who uh, was born in 1992 and passed away in 2020, right before he released his um, first book, After Parties, which is a collection of stories, which did very well, landed many places. And so I'm sure some of you know it. Um, it is and will be a an incredible book. Um, and we're so happy that it's it's out there in the world. Um, Anthony, during his time um, writing, was also a prose editor for Adroit. So we got to know Anthony really well and <laughs> um, got to sort of have the um, unique gift of, of having Anthony and, and watching Anthony rise. Um, so we, when we set out to create a fiction companion to the um, poetry scholars program that we have, the Greg Janikian uh, Scholars in Poetry, we knew that immediately that we wanted uh, we wanted to honor Anthony with the uh, with the recognition. So it's a thrill um, and an honor to see it um, to see it realized here tonight in the form of faces and incredible work that you all will get to hear. Um, and so, so yeah, please join me in um, in welcoming these readers and um, in appreciating the work of Anthony Vaznesso uh, today, tomorrow, and into the future. Okay, so uh, oh, someone is unmuted. Okay. Um, Oh, turns out I can mute you. Sorry, I'm just going to mute people <laughs> if they're <laughs> muted and and um or unmuted and not supposed to be. So, um, sorry, no hard feelings. But uh, without further ado, let's dive in. Um, we are starting this evening with Cleo John, uh, who is a writer from Southern California. Her work has appeared in The Guardian, Shenandoah, Pleiades, The Common, and elsewhere. She lives in New York City, and Let's Go, Let's Go, Let's Go is her first book, which is coming very soon from Tin House. So I will uh, let Cleo take it. Hi, Peter. Thank you for the introduction, and congratulations to all of the um, Anthony Viasas. So scholars, I was a big fan of After Parties, um, and even before his book came out, I was looking forward to it because I had been a fan of his short stories, so it was really sad when he passed away. Um, like Peter said, um, I'm gonna be reading a short story called Zeros and Ones that's coming out in a joint journal. Um, and it's um, one of the stories in my forthcoming short story collection, Let's Go, Let's Go, Let's Go. Um, the only thing you have to know is that it follows a character named Luna who does recur through a couple of the other stories in the collection. And in this story, she um, has just moved to China for a job and as a recent college graduate. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to start. Our first week at the job, my boss took us to a Korean fried chicken restaurant near campus. It was still warm enough to sit outside. He ordered beers and paid for the food, then leaned back in his chair, smoking a cigarette whose thin trail dissipated into the air. His conversation branched off rapidly. He was a prodigious reader of various ephemera. He talked about the restoration of Yipu Garden, the Cloud Forest Conservatory in Singapore, the work with fiber optics one of the campus labs was doing, and all the while, he didn't touch his food. His English was energetic, if not entirely fluid. The focus of, the focus of his attention was intense when it landed, but distractible and erratic. Marcus joined him in the smoking, and I leaned away from the smell. But in truth, I didn't mind the smoking. I liked listening to that low flow of words and barely connected ideas under the nicotine haze perfuming the evening air, which I inhaled along with the glorious feeling of invisibility. As I listened to him speak, I thought of Melissa in faraway Stockholm, 
who was also a great talker. Earlier, she'd posted an Instagram photo of a bright leafy cafe lunch with a glimpse of the torso of her boyfriend. She would have had much to say about everything, about my apartment, Marcus, my boss, the fact that I was actually in China. And I remembered that she had visited Suzo once when she was young. I thought of texting her, but even after the three of us parted ways after the meal, I didn't. The year I lived in China, Korean media was banned because of THAAD, and Chinese military operations were advancing farther into the South China Sea. For two months, I made no friends. I went to bars and restaurants alone, but I found it hard to talk to anyone. I looked the same as everyone else in the restaurants. There was nothing to indicate I was an outsider or different, and thus my presence incited no curiosity. This was the comforting chain from the constant alienation of my life in America, but it also worked against me. Whenever I returned to my apartment, I sank into an unmovable lethargy. On social media, Melissa posted photos of cake in Vienna, train stations in Florence, the waterfront in Stockholm, always with the rangy shadow of Casper half in frame. For our last two years at Barnard, she and I had been best friends. The whole summer after graduation, while I was still in New York and she was just starting her teaching job in Europe, we talked every day. We called each other all the time until Casper came along. They must be traveling Europe together, I deduced. He must be practically moved in with her by now. Meanwhile, the most exploring I did was walking along the fruit stalls and cheap electronic stores in the two blocks around my apartment. I started tutoring on weekends at a college prep company where Marcus also part-timed. Under the terms of the fellowship, this wasn't technically allowed, but the cash was hard to trace. On days when I didn't want to go back to my empty studio, I would stay late at the language center and listen to my boss talk. He was always able to fill the silence and never asked about my personal life. Once, I stayed late designing a set of flyers. It was just the two of us. He brought me a cup of tea and a paper cup. When I finally got up to leave, he thanked me for staying late and put a hand on top of my head. For a single moment, I thought about kissing him. I fell in love often when I lived in Suzo. Not long after that, I went to a hair salon to get a cut and dye. The stylist, a young man with fluffed up hair and a quiet demeanor, was meticulous. I closed my eyes as he shampooed my hair, running warm water over my head. When he pressed his fingers along my scalp, firmly but ever so lightly, my heart quivered. Gentleness, any gentleness, touched me so easily then. Most evenings, I ordered fried chicken from the same student hotspot near campus and took the food back to my studio where I streamed Korean TV dramas and celebrity interviews with my VPN or played Hakuoki, Demon of the Fleeting Blossom until two in the morning. These were things I had done as a high schooler and I was filled with a sickening and yet satisfying feeling of regression into immaturity. The basic structure of Hakuoki, as with any otome game, is that you play a female character surrounded by five or so guys and by the end of the game, one of them will be in love with you. The context defer. You could be playing a young woman captured by the Shinsengumi samurai in the Edo period, a high school girl who time travels into the past and arrives at an archeological dig, the first female student at a previously all boys school, an older version of Alice in Wonderland where the Mad Hatter, the Rabbit and the Cheshire Cat are all hot guys. But in each game, the male archetypes are pretty universal. There is the hyperactive younger boy type, the cool, prince type, the cold intellectual type, the hard on the outside, soft on the inside tsundere type, and his inverse, the soft on the outside, mean on the inside yandere. Choosing the right thing to say from a menu of options gave you romance points. You could play different routes depending on which character you wanted to fall in love with you, and you could replay the game over and over to get all the characters. Visually, I tended to go for the hot guy with glasses, especially if he had a touch of mischief. I was also weak for the tsundere type. The nice, gentle ones and the strong and silent ones didn't interest me, which maybe said something about my attachment style. In Hakuoki, I started with the Okita route, the best swordsman of the Chinsengumi, cocky, smart-mouthed, mischievous, and cold-hearted. When I had accumulated enough romance points, he would say coded things like, it'd be troubling if you were scared of me. Sometimes I also played the games in which you were a male character surrounded by females of various types who fell in love with you. Those tended to have sex scenes. 
It was my idea to go dancing with Ten Ten and Marcus on the night that I met Zero One. Ten Ten, a Chinese girl two years older than me, who studied at George Washington University, taught math at the tutoring company with me and Marcus. She had lustrous skin and rosy cheeks and fine boned hands perfectly suited for music, of which she knew nothing. I was feeling suddenly acutely restless, aware of the fact that I was wasting my time, that I was boring, that I was alone, that I would only be 22 for so long. That morning, Melissa had texted me a photo. I opened the message and saw a picture of a table decked out with food. She'd written, how's China? We had a work potluck, I made cookies. She had posted the exact same photo on her Instagram the day before. At the club, I didn't know how to move. I bobbed my head up and down and moved my shoulders a little bit and was embarrassed. 1010 plied me with drinks, trying to get me to loosen up. Two Brazilian girls came over with mojitos. Under their long, loosely glimmering brown hair, they had sweet young faces and wore sequin tops the size of handkerchiefs, showing flat, beautiful stomachs. What are you doing here? I wanted to know. It wasn't like this was the party city. People were looking at them. They stuck out. Marcus, too, was singled out for his whiteness. I could see Chinese girls closing in on him at the bar. One of the Brazilian girls coughed, embarrassed, and said that she'd been dating a guy in Shanghai, but he was an asshole, the friend said. I looked at them more closely. Are you guys underage? They admitted, yes, they were. I'm Luna, I introduced myself. The alcohol was getting to me and the room was spinning. I had the beginnings of a headache. The two girls pulled me out from the table to dance. Their hair fell over their shoulders. They were good dancers, shimmying effortlessly, and they were also kind, putting their hands on my hips and trying to show me how to move. I tried, but my body wouldn't obey. Ten Ten held onto my hands and tried to shake the beat down my arms. Luna, she tried to cheer, come on. For a moment, I saw myself as others would see me, tight around the mouth, with a stiff, awkward expression, someone who was repressed, controlled, with a nervous, people-pleasing smile, a hard and uncomfortable person. Who would want to be friends with someone like that? Who would love someone like that? Okay, I'm gonna stop there. And um, thank you again, Peter, for having me. Thank you so much, Cleo. I just, I wrote in the chat, but I love the flow of the story and the way that it, it feels so natural and yet it's so lush with with that lyric description that as a poet, I just, I latch on to. Um, so thank you for sharing that story with us and thank you for sharing the story with all of us tonight. Um, yeah, everyone's complimenting in the in the chat, which feels, feels right to me. <laughs> um, just a reminder, so Cleo's book is coming from Tin House, uh, August, not April, August 15th. Uh, let's go, let's go, let's go. Pre-order. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so our next reader this evening is uh, Vincent Chavez. Pardon me, well, there we go. <laughs> I had to find the tab. Vincent Chavez um, is a Chicano writer from Santa Paula, California. His fiction has appeared in the Southern Review, Wigleaf, Joyland, Quali Journal, and the Master's Review. He is a Tin House scholar and his work has been supported by the Macondo Writers Workshop and the Voices of Our Nation Arts Foundation. He holds a bachelor's in English from the University of California, Berkeley, and an MFA in fiction from Virginia Commonwealth University. And we are so excited that he is also the first tonight of our six uh, Anthony Vea's Nassau Scholars in Fiction. So take it away, Vincent. All right, thanks, Peter. And I just wanna say thanks to the Adroit Journal for making space for all of our stories tonight. And then also just for this wonderful honor with the Anthony Vea's Nassau Scholarship. Um, so really nice to be able to remember him tonight in this way. Uh, I'm going to be reading from my short story, Drain Plug. Uh, just going to skip a couple paragraphs into it. Going to do about 10 minutes of reading of it, and that will be it. Uh, just for some context, the story is about these three brothers who just want to go fishing. Uh, they've been waiting in line to get into the marina behind a bunch of cars for about 30 minutes. And just as about they're, just as about they're going to go through the marina's gate, somebody cuts in front of them and it creates all this chaos. So go ahead and start. Frank slams his fist down on his horn again and lets it blur out for five whole seconds. 
The driver rolls his window down. An arm comes out and sticks a middle finger up towards the sky. Pinche chuntaros, Frank mutters. It isn't the first time you've heard your brother say this word. Your brother is a foreman. It's what he calls field workers. Some of the Mexicans who work underneath him, the pickers and plasters who sit by themselves and get drunk at Las Piedras Park after a couple of block, after work a couple blocks from your neighborhood. The ones who come into the pool hall with cologne smelling like vinegar in groups of five or six. Fucking mariachis, Frank says every time he sees them. Goddamn nationals, paisas. One time on the way back from the grocery store and past the park, you ask Frank why he didn't call them wetbacks. Why he didn't call them beaners or spicks. Like how a few of the fifth grader white boys would call you and your friends at school. Who the hell's calling you that, he'd said. Never did get an answer from him. We're told to go handle your business with the gavachos. Don't let anyone ever call you that, he'd said, ever. Both Frank and Vic are sitting next to you, looking pissed, so you figure you ought to say something. Vic always says you got a big mouth, but you don't care. Both your brothers are almost 10 years older than you. And even when you do talk, they hardly listen anyways. Well, it's not like they're moving, you say. Dumb Paisa still got to wait in line to launch their boat, too. You look over at Frank to see if he had said the right thing. Frank stays quiet, so Vic seizes his opportunity. Did somebody pull your string, he says. You keep looking at Frank all desperate, but he's still mean mugging the Buick, looking at it like he's about to chew off his whole bottom lip. For Vic, it's the signal to keep going. Frank's silence always is. Frank, you hear this, kid, he says. Sounds like to me it's all right if we just start letting people cut in front of us. I didn't say that, you say, and don't you start calling me kid. I'll call you whatever I want, Vic says. You know, Eddie, according to your logic, it sounds like you want Frank here to pull us off to the side of the road, start letting everyone go past us. And we've already been waiting here for over half an hour. What's another 30, right? That's not what I was saying. I figure that's what I heard. Enough, Frank shouts. What's wrong with the both of you? He gives a death stare to Vic. What are you, nine? Go to hell, Vic says. You're mouthing off at him when he points at the Buick. So what are we going to do about this? I say we slash their tires, you butt in again. Knowing Frank won't take Vic that seriously. You picture pulling out the big Bowie knife Frank keeps in his glove compartment and running it through the Buick's cracked white wall wheels. The hiss that spilled out from the tires as Frank did the same on the opposite side of the car. Like how you did that one time with those crazy rednecks. Remember, Frank? Your brother ignores you. He buries his face into his palms for a few seconds and then takes a long, hard look at the Buick. Both of you stay here, he says. Then he steps out of the cab. Hey, where are you going? I cry out, but it's already too late. Frank doesn't look back. He never looks back. He marches over to the Buick. See what you do, Vic says as he opens up his door. Me, I say. They're the ones who cut in front of us. Vic takes a deep breath before stepping out from the truck. It's always all show with him. Sure, you've seen him get forced into breaking up a couple of Frank's fights. Get convinced by his buddies to sneak out of your guy's bedroom at night to go key up the cars of the white folks who'd thrown rocks at them before their high school football games. The way he always hesitates, though, in the moment, tells you he's never ready to just go in and throw a couple of jingasles. Up ahead, Frank has got his hands on his belt buckle. He's saying something to the still-seated driver, and you wonder why Vic still hasn't left the truck yet. You think he's a coward. In fact, you know he is. You try to crawl over to the driver's side door to let yourself out from the Ford, but Vic spots you. Don't you dare open that, he says. Why not, you say. I want to help. And do what exactly, Vic says. Just wait here. Tears well up in your eyes as he slams his door in your face. Cars lined up behind you are honking like crazy. Vic throws his hands up, yells at them to give him a break. As he jogs over, the Buick driver swings his door open and almost clips Frank. Frank holds his ground even though the driver is three times the size. They start shouting at each other in Spanish and you damn near bump your head on the top of the Ford's cabin as you anticipate the two of them coming to blows. They don't, but when Vic runs up, 
He still separates them. An old lady steps out from the Buick as he does so. She looks like your grandma. She's just as good at yelling at your brothers too. Keep saying in Spanish for Vic to keep his dirty hands off her son. From the back of the Buick, you notice four pairs of eyes watching you. They're kids' eyes, just like yours. It isn't long before a white man in a tie comes over from the marina and breaks it all up. His face turns purple as he jabs his finger at each of them. You people, he calls them one time, two times. You count your fingers, three, then four, then five. He barks at them to get back in their cars, that he ought to kick all of them out. For a split second, you reckon your brothers and the paisa should team up. The way the white man yells at them makes you think they might. It surprises you how quick it takes to hate him more than anything. Nobody says anything to the white man, well. None of them shake hands by the time they're all told to split. Frank mutters something underneath his breath at the paisas, and as soon as him and Vic turn their backs on them, the old lady shakes her head and spits in their direction. She says something to the driver once she's back in the Buick, and they both laugh. She eyes your brothers as they walk back to the Ford, and the driver keeps laughing, like it's the funniest thing he's ever said. She's ever said. You've seen this before. I'd seen it in the faces of the white boys every time you and your friends had confronted them. There's nothing to be done about it, Eddie, your friend said before the last time you walked up on the white boys during recess. You're going to go in solo. Your friends had been being pussies. What's wrong with you, man? They're bigger than you. Just let go already. You couldn't, though. Not anymore, anyway. Every lunch after they'd fucked you guys, it was always the same, talking about coulda, shoulda, woulda. You'd never heard Frank talk about what he would have done. You'd never heard him talk about what he would have said after somebody had crossed him, your folks, or your brothers. That's how Frank was. He did what he meant, and he meant what he said. You wanted to be like that. It was like he was never afraid to do what he had to do, even when everybody was watching. You were afraid when you went to go face off with the white boys, but you always remembered how they stared at you when you walked up to them. How surprised they all ended up looking a few seconds after they turned their backs on you. They'd been playing football in their part of the playground at the time. Meanwhile, your friends had been watching all go down from the safety of the monkey bars. You wondered if they could see how good it felt to slip into one of the white boys' huddles and steal their football from them. You wondered if they could hear how powerful it made you feel every time you shouted at the white boys, every time you puffed out your chest and told them they were nothing but a bunch of stupid gavachos. It took five seconds for you to get run down, five seconds for you to get dragged into a patch of mud, to get kicked and socked, for them all to laugh at you. Your friends only came to help you after the recess bell had rung and the white boys had run off. They had scooped you from the mud and kept saying how badass you were, even though they thought you died and looked like fucking roadkill. You walked home with them that day with a bruise on your stomach in the shape of a shoe. The way they kept going about and about the whole thing, though, told you that moment would live forever. When your brothers are back in the Ford, Frank lights himself a cigarette. Vic doesn't say nothing, just stares out the window. We're not gonna let him get away with this, you say to Frank. He keeps smoking, closes his eyes and blows a few puffs out from his window. Are we? Drop it, Eddie, Vic says. It's over. No one, Frank, it isn't. It can't be. Frank, you say again. All you want is to be part of the plan. Frank puts his forward and drive and the truck rolls forward a few feet. Just be ready, he says to you. You catch Vic staring at him for a few seconds. Frank does too. It's a rare sight, Vic questioning him. Got something on your mind, Frank says. Vic swallows. Nothing, he says. I mean, just that we don't gotta pull anything here. Frank looks down at you for a second not really into your eyes. His face is sort of blank as he looks at you over your head. He peers back up at the Buick. What do you want from me, Vic? He says with his eyes dead set ahead. Vic sinks into his chair a little bit more. I want to fish, he says, that's it. Frank presses his foot down on the gas one more time, glances up in the rear view mirror. All right, he says, get your fucking pull out from the back of my truck and go fish then. All right, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Vincent. Um, 
Tierney from the chat says, such a strong voice, strong characters, and also a really great reader. I have to agree. Um, I remember the first time I read this story um, from the, you know, submissions, and I just being struck by the presence on the page. Um, and I think that that came through in that reading uh, just now. So thank you for sharing that story with us. Uh, our next reader is our second Vaznesov Scholar of the Night, uh, Ani Cooney. Ani Cooney is a UCLA and Vona alum and is the winner of a Pan America Robert J. Dow Short Story Prize. His work can be found or is forthcoming in the Georgia Review, Epiphany Magazine, Best Debut Short Stories, the Pen America Dow Prize Anthology, and elsewhere. He is One Story Magazine's 2022 Adina Talv Goodman Fellow. Please welcome Ani Cooney. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, thank you, Kalpana and Heidi and the Adroit team for crafting the space for us readers to share our words. Um, I'm so honored to be an Anthony Viasna so scholar this year. Um, you know, he and I DM'd a lot and he was always such a generous person um, to an emerging writer like me, always giving out advice um, about the ins and outs of the industry. And oh, I always appreciated that insight from um, a fellow queer Asian American writer. Um, yeah, and he was hilarious. Yes, yes. Um, I'm gonna read uh, a little bit from my short story called uh, The Bear of Memory. It's gonna be short. Um, um, it's an unnamed narrator and um, one of the main characters names is Sal and Fiona. The talk at the gro grocery store where I work concerns a black bear that will not sleep. They say it's been rummaging through the trash of homes and some restaurants a short distance away from Kings Beach, Lake Tahoe. They say it moves weary and heavy in the black winter nights. The bear, according to Fiona Chan, is about six foot three and thick on the hips. Fiona had seen its muscled neck and back as it walked away from the trash behind her home. Oh, he sure did enjoy the leftover curry. What a mess. Fiona recounts her tale to the tourists while she bags their groceries. Her story spins longer when there are more items to bag as you can imagine. She repeats the story all day long to the customers with their shiny windbreakers and fur-lined hoodies. This is a gentler story to share with strangers who don't want to hear how she left her husband because he wanted five kids and she wanted none. In the break room that day, the local news reports the bear sighting and warns that there may be more encounters on the rice. People, mostly the visitors staying in Lake Tahoe, are attracting them with unlocked garbage bins. The bears are looking for unfamiliar tastes. They're acquiring them in jam and marmalade, noodles, sparkly fruity drinks, and the protein nut bars the tourists bring to King's Beach. Did you know the newscasters begin to banter at the end of the segment that black bears will remember locations where they can find food even after many years? Oh, wow, I didn't know that, the other reporter says. Now, did you know that bears are very cautious of other predators, including us humans? But they're losing their natural fear towards us because we're encroaching the wild. You can't blame the bears, people. After break, I entered the stock freezer with my list of thaw and sell for the week. I unpack the food in the cold, and all I can think about is the bear. Why isn't it hibernating like the other bears? Why is it restless? What kind of leftover foods has it eaten? What is it hungry for? I pocket a handful of protein bars from the stock and drive home. I drive slowly, looking beyond the wet bark and trunks of the ponderosa pine trees, and I hope to see the bear that will not sleep. In our front patio, only three bulbs on our string lights remain incandescent. The rest have frozen during the beginning of winter and Sal forgot to replace the bulbs again. He often tells me, you know, the memory goes bad once you hit 35. 
I walk up the stairs to our cabin and find Sal snowboarding helmet on a chair. Then I almost trip on his all mountain board that he uses as a snowboarding instructor. I've told him not to leave it lying around in the dark like this. Somebody's bound to trip and get in a nasty fall. I see people in the living room. It's Sal and his AA buddies. And I could tell that, that they're in a deep listening session. Their sessions have titles that sound like skits sometimes. The dazzling butterfly effect meeting, the serene aftermath of recovery meeting, the solutions by the lake meeting. This one looks like a big book study meeting because everybody has their books in their laps as if they're reading a Bible. They don't see me standing outside, so I walk around to the back where some of the mini globe lights also hang frozen, their filaments extra taut in their bulbs. I begin to unscrew them one by one, then only two remain lit in the back patio. Penelope watches me from our bedroom window, meowing. I blow warm air on the window pane. It obscures me. She, ma she meows even more. Inside, I hear a synchronous mantra and clapping. I hear Sal make a muffled joke and everyone laughs. The meeting is over. I knock on the back kitchen door and everyone waves a hello at me. All I want to take is a long hot shower. While the two of us prepare for dinner, Sal tells me he is two years sober. Did you forget, honey bear? He asks with a smile on his face. He places a bronze recovery chip over his nose and sticks out his tongue like the joker that he is. Now this particular number slips my mind. I didn't know he was counting. I kiss him and take a closer look at his healthy skin and unchapped lips. His dimples are visible again on his baby cheeks beneath the patchy hair. His breath smells of butter crackers, the fish-shaped ones he tells me to bring from the grocery store. Of course not, I say to him. How could I forget? What a milestone. This is what happens in order that evening. I take a hot shower. Sal and I, ha Sal and I have sex, but he cannot finish. I'm too excited, he whispers to me. So I finish on my own while he touches my skin. Penelope jumps on the windowsill afterwards, and I whisper to Sal about the bear that roams the winter before we sleep. And that's where I'm gonna read from now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ani. <clears throat> I, I just love that story. Ah. <laughs> Sometimes you just love a story. I just do. And so does everybody else in the chat, which is how it should be. <laughs> um, okay. I never know where this tab is. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> um, next up is Kelly X. Huey, who is a student journalist, abolitionist, community organizer, and ghostwriter, person who writes about ghosts, asterisk. Um, she is a Mellon Mays fellow studying English, creative, uh, sorry, <laughs> English, critical race and ethnic studies and creative writing at the University of Chicago. In her free time, she works as a barista in the basement coffee shop of the Divinity School. Please welcome Kelly X. Y. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, I'm so happy and honored to be here with you all tonight. Um, so I'm gonna read an abbreviated version of my story, um, The History of Water. And this is actually the first piece of fiction I ever wrote. So I'm so happy that it's found a home with the Adroit Journal um, and to be called an Anthony Viasenso scholar when I really love his writing so much. Um, so here it is. Like any good daughter, I believe my mother when she lies. The first lie I remember though, the one about my father has always seemed the most honest. Your nine, I gave birth to him in a river outside Chengdu, my mother says. She spent 18 hours with her knees pressed against the dirt bed. He came out like a fish, slick and pink with want. He swam away and never came back. This is all she says about him. My mother is a good storyteller because she is unwasteful with her words. She believes in the economy of language and its cost and its precision. My father is worth half a sentence, a few choice phrases in Mandarin. 
When my fifth grade class goes on a field trip to the aquarium, I translate the permission slip for her wrong, replacing aquarium with museum. I worry that she won't let me go. She thinks there's a chance I could see my father. But as the field trip grows closer, I fear I have killed him with my own lie, translated him into bone, a fossilized thing in a museum. The day of the field trip, I pretend I'm sick and my mother lets me stay home. I am a good daughter and a fast learner. When I grow older, I begin to catch her in lies. My friend Jenny Shao's father leaves their family and my mother curses, so American, back home the men never leave. What about dad? I am so clever and stupid with my youth. My mother chases me out the house with a fly swatter. As I dodge her flimsy violence, I wonder how my father found my mother, the hook of her. I wonder if I am half fish and that's why I love to take long showers. I come back hours later contrite. My mother is sitting at the kitchen table so still that I could almost believe she hadn't moved at all since I left. You just forgot how he swam away from us, I say. My mother shakes her head. At her hairline, a strand of gray shadows her forehead. Water is a history, she insists. It remembers where it goes and comes back. I remember. Before I leave for college, my mother makes me download WeChat and messages me daily. Study hard, find good man. Make sure he is not fish. I respond with thumbs up reactions. She calls me every Sunday to talk. I tell her about my classes, the friends I've made. She tells me she's been going on walks with a woman named Zhang Yue who has a daughter a year above me. A few months into the semester, I get four missed calls. It's my mom, sorry, I mouth to the girl with me. Her name is Eleanor like the Beatles song and she is tall like a painting. What's going on, Ma? You didn't respond. I just make sure it wasn't you, she says, before hanging up. I've missed a call from her. I missed a text from her. I click the link she sends me. It tells me that a young woman was found naked and mutilated on the street a couple towns over, and that I have two free articles left this month. She messages me an hour later. You see? I reply, yeah, sad. Be careful. Don't let strange man gut you. When my mother is angry with me, she has a favorite cautionary tale. In the olden days, when China was going through a boy drought, no one wanted the baby girls that were born. They were starved, abandoned in the middle of fields, thrown into rivers. Be glad you were born here, where there is no body of water near us, she says sternly. No place to drown. I picture a daughter-shaped river, a flood full of unwanted girls. It's too late, I say once, joking, because I've learned to navigate the distance between drought and mouth. I'm too big for you to throw. Silly girl, it was always the men who did the throwing. The telling of the story unfurls her fury, and at the end, she releases a quiet, contented sigh, the sound of a baby girl hitting the river floor. My mother becomes convinced I am going to die. She sends me more dead girls and makes sure I see each one. She messages me at increasingly odd hours of the night. Home? Yeah. Sometimes I lie. I begin staying the night at Eleanor's and go on WeChat from her bed, languaging it as my own. So much crime near school. Get nice boyfriend to protect you. I turn off my phone and reach for Eleanor. Somewhere far away, a river begins to flood. You've forgotten me, my mother says on the phone with me, plaintive. I'm just really busy right now, ma. You should a whole new year, that you should be able to forget me. What do you mean? Hey, have you been going on your walks with Zhang Yue? Just as a river is a type of body, a story is a type of lie. There is a story my mother tells about a tiger named Hu Gu Po who disguised itself as a woman to eat children. One day, a mother left her two young daughters to go to the market. The tiger woman came to their village and knocked at the door. When the daughters looked out the window, they saw an old woman with hair the color of the moon. The woman explained that she had been walking all morning and wondered whether these two girls could spare any water. The two daughters, who, who had been taught by their mother to be kind, let her in, gave her water, a fresh bowl of rice. Concern striping the wrinkle lines on her face, the old woman asked if the two girls were alone. 
The older daughter said she was sure the woman would want to be on her way as soon as she finished her meal. Yes, Hu Gu Po said, I am starving. The tiger opened its mouth, jaw unhinging itself like a door. It swallowed the two daughters whole. The mother returned to the village at night when the sky was storm dark and the wind howled like a man. She saw the, dopen, the open door and rushed into the house, but it was too late. Her daughters were gone. My girls have just gone to the well to get more water, she thought. Look, our water basin is empty. I will wait for their return. She spent the rest of her life waiting. The first time my mother tells me the story, I wait for the twist ending. I think the tiger must be the mother, testing her two daughters, making sure they are ready for the world. But the lesson here is that some things are simple. Mothers cannot become tigers. Tigers eat daughters, and mothers cannot save them. I get the call that my mother has disappeared when I'm in the shower. I press the phone to my ear, but can barely hear Zhang Yue's nervous voice over the rush of the water. She's gone. She left the house and hasn't been back. The police can't find her. You have to come home. I wonder if all Chinese women lie well, if the truth is cleaved from them like a country. I call the cops with my wet phone. Your mother is a missing person. Ma'am, where are you? The signal shit. I can barely hear you. Can you call us back? The policeman's job is to arrest the truth, my mother said once. I twist the shower nozzle to the highest setting, hoping to scald off all these lies. I spend so long in the bathroom, I half believe I'll follow the water down the drain. Water holds memory. Every river is a birth story. My mother is gone. The police look for months, but they'll never find her. Zhang Yue plans a funeral, but she isn't dead. At night beside Eleanor, I dream of a fish swimming in a river outside a city I've never been in. I dream of generous rivers, rivers giving birth to beautiful baby girls, rivers winnowing against the weight of a child. After the funeral, I come back to my mother's empty home, sit at the kitchen table and wait for her return. Thank you. I'm sorry, that's your first story? <laughs> like what? Um, incredible, just, yeah, incredible. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and wow, if that's not what this scholarship exists to recognize, then I don't know what it exists to recognize. That is so exciting. And I think I speak for everybody here when I say we cannot wait to see what you write next. Next, woo. <laughs> okay, next up is the amazing Gracie Newman, who is a writer from Buffalo, New York. She is currently a fellow in fiction at the Missioner Center at UT Austin, and she holds a degree in English from Stanford University. Her work has appeared in Joyland, Nimrod, and elsewhere. And like everybody else in this string, she is also a 2023 Vasnesis scholar in fiction. Please welcome Gracie Newman. Thank you so much um, to both Peter and Heidi for arranging this amazing event. Um, I'm really honored to be among such talented writers, and um, as always, I'm, I'm really indebted to the legacy of Anthony Viesnoso. Um, so I'm going to read a couple excerpts from a story called Kelp, um, and all you need to know is really um, a woman and her husband are arguing about whether or not to have children in the face of the Anthropocene. Kevin insists that I would make a great mother. I hate to give him the first word here, but that's where it all started, with his strange desire for life. Any sort of life will do, or it used to. He collects all the plants and animals he can, particularly the marine kind. Before we moved in together, Kevin kept several species of kelp in his bathtub. It was one of those old clawfoot kinds, yellowing and separate from the shower. The porcelain had the texture of a cracked tooth. I hated the tub even when he got rid of the plants not because of the kelp thing, but because of its feet. I didn't like the thought that the vessel holding my naked body was poised to run away at any moment. We talked about it before, and I'd been clear that I didn't want children. Kevin said he was okay with that. He said we would travel. But a year into our marriage, Kevin begins to get antsy. He starts commenting on the babies in strollers and saying things like, if we do end up having a kid, so far, we've been here and once to Nova Scotia, and we're only here for his work anyway. 
Here is Monterey. Kevin's a marine biologist, a specialist in kelp forest ecology. He's been invited to spend six months researching at Hopkins Marine Station. There's a team trying to figure out how to stop the purple urchins that have been devouring the kelp forests. It's a crisis, he tells me, for the coasts of Northern California. I resist the move at first. I like San Francisco in the summer, the only time when the harsh wind feels like a blessing. I have a good routine where I wake up early and swim in the black water of the bay. I go to work. At night, the two of us cook simple dinners together and watch two episodes of the latest serial drama. I don't usually have the stomach for comedy. On Fridays, we tour different ice cream parlors around the city to find the best pistachio. There's also the issue of the fish. Kevin needs something swimming nearby at all times. We have three fish tanks in our apartment that each costs about the same as my car. Kevin usually keeps between 30 and 50 species, not counting crustaceans. He could watch the fish for literal hours. Before I got sober, sometimes I'd smoke a joint or drink a bottle of wine and join him. A few people have commented on how fishy the apartment smells, but I don't notice it anymore. Every month we have to allot a fish budget. Don't you find it a little strange? A friend asked after her first visit to our apartment. I mean, you're basically living in a tide pool. Every night in bed, Kevin tries to convince me to join him at the station. The quiet ones are always tricky though, and he finally gets me to agree by holding me at the brink of orgasm. Besides, he whispers, squeezing my hand as I come, migration is a natural thing. So we move down here to Monterey. I like the town at first. It suits my particular brand of melancholy. The streets by our house are mostly residential with an aggressive number of churches on every block. Laundromats, liquor stores galore. As you get closer to the water, the roads start sprouting shitty seafood places and old thrift stores that I wander in and out of. Mostly it's just overpriced wicker furniture and framed nature prints, but occasionally I'll find something interesting. A live seagull, for example, that I mistook for a statue. The shiniest coin I've ever seen with the dates rubbed off completely. The whole town feels a little precarious, as if it's being pulled towards the flailing waves. Maybe it's just because most of Monterey is built on a hill that slopes towards the craggy coast. Further down towards the ocean, you reach Cannery Row. Like many things, it's mostly a disappointment that smells like fish and piss. The street is lined with tourist shops and restaurants and motels that charge like they've got the H. Even when the streets are busy, it's quiet. We rent the top floor of an old house five blocks from the sea. The entire place is covered with kitsch, TJ Maxx nautical knickknacks and posters with expressions like seize the day and find the silver lining. I turn them all around to face the wall. We end up with a California king in a gas stove we don't know how to use. There's an antique high chair in the corner of the kitchen, which I cover with a coat. From the porch, you could see a slender line of ocean. Kevin brings one of his tanks so that he can keep watch over his favorite fish, leaving detailed instructions with our neighbor about how to care for all of the other, less favored specimens. It had taken up the entirety of my car's back seat. He puts the tank on our new kitchen table in the shade where the fish can keep cool. We eat on the couch. Fish don't even exist, you know. That category of animal was debunked as a veritable taxonomic class in the 80s. Most marine species only seem similar because they're scaled and swimming. Genetically, fish are all over the place. Lungfish are more closely related to us, for example, than they are to tuna or salmon. It figures the man I married is obsessed by creatures that aren't even real, at least not outside his imagination. So it's not so bad at first. Kevin and I fall into our own half-joined routines. I carve out my preferred running routes, and the woman who lives downstairs shows me how to bake a tomato pie with flaky golden crust and thick, spicy filling. Every Monday, I go to the farmer's market and pick out the fattest tomatoes I can find. Kevin watches me bake in the evening with a warm expression that I don't quite like. The thing that really surprises me is the sex. The coastal air gives us some sort of renewed energy that leaves us both panting in the frigid air conditioning. After dark, every touch feels red and electric, like the glowing filaments inside of a toaster. Kevin, in particular, seems to be putting more passion into it. 
I can see the determination in his gray eyes each time he holds himself over me, grinning ferociously as the salt of his sweat dries on my skin. It's a primal thing, I decide. Being around so much sea life has gotten us excited. Even I will admit that the curvature of certain shells strikes me as erotic. But in the back of my mind, I worry that he's trying to get me pregnant through sheer sexual enthusiasm. It's the kind of thing he would do. I don't talk to that many people, and those to which I do are usually strangers. Hey you, calls an old man from his car one day. He has a life-size skeleton sitting in his passenger seat. He calls after me until I stop running and take an earbud out. His gray beard trails all the way down to his navel, and he's wearing a tie-dye shirt emblazoned with a peace sign. He gestures me over, and I carefully walk a few feet towards the car. You're the prettiest fucking thing I've seen all day, he tells me. It's 6.30 a.m., I say. Sure, he says, and then he points to the water, which is veiled in the pink fog of sunrise. The broken vertebrae of the San Francisco skyline are just visible through the vapor. But look at your competition. We both squint at the sea for a moment, where the seals are barking gleefully in the distance. Thank you. That's very kind. He smiles as he relights his joint, and I worry that his beard is going to catch on fire. Beside him, the skeleton stares blearily out at the water. I have the strange thought that I might be meeting a god. Flush dice twirl slowly from the rearview mirror. I guess so, he says. More and more of our fish start showing up dead, and I stalk the local pet stores to try to find replacements. First the pipefish take ill, and then the big-eyed squirrelfish kick the bucket all at once. No doubt Kevin will notice eventually, but I wanted to delay whatever small grief he might feel as long as possible. Life's just one long exercise in postponing the inevitable. I start attending the local AA meetings because there are too many opportunities to drink to not think about it. I am by myself a lot. The one I choose is held on Wednesday evenings in the parking lot of an ugly cement church. Bird shit everywhere. The group leader is a young guy named Steve who works as a kayaking instructor. At the third meeting, I speak about my reluctance to have a child, how I won't risk holding the weight of another life when I can remember struggling so desperately with my own. I talk about how irresponsible it seems to bring life into a dying planet and how the thought of it makes me want to uncork every bottle in sight, how I'm not sure I can make it this month without drinking, much less nine more. I talk and talk until I realize I'm being rude. The only thing I don't talk about is why I got sober in the first place. I had never intended to quit because to do so would suggest I had a problem, and I didn't, or that's what I told myself. I just liked the way the world seemed to relax around me when I drank and the small golden feeling it spun in my chest. A few swills made everything better. Parties and dinners, sure, but also work, walks, household chores. A lot of alcoholics have rousing stories about the incident that inspired their sobriety. Me, I passed out and almost drowned in the shower. Or that's what Kevin said, anyway, during his one-man intervention in our living room. I don't remember it at all. During my sixth meeting, Steve asked me to recite the serenity prayer, and all of a sudden, I forget that, too. One morning, I find Kevin standing in front of the fish tank. His face is bathed in its turquoise light, the artificial tides playing across his jawbone. Have any of the fish died, he asks. No, I say. Why? Another weekend, we go hiking in Big Sur. The wildflowers are blooming yellow and orange, like fire on the cliffs running down to the blue sea. The sunshine is soft and coppery as we wind our way around the sea cliffs. As we hike, we talk about the latest episode of the crime show we've started and debate the ethics of pescatarianism. A rabbit with one ear crosses our path, and Kevin decides it's good luck. Greenery is everywhere. From the lookout point, we share a canteen of grapefruit kombucha and FaceTime my parents to show them the view. As we get up to start the long return trek, Kevin looks back wistfully at the sea. It's a shame, he says, that we're destroying all this. Below us, the pale water jumps against the cliffs and dissolves back into itself, white foam running through the bay like veins. I don't know what to say, so I kiss him, hard, on the mouth. As we hike back to the car, I wonder what he's imagining. I picture bubbling acid water and flaming schools of fish floating along Highway 1. 
When I tell this to Kevin, he assures me that climate change will wipe out civilization far before that happens. I think we'll die before it gets that bad, honestly, he says. As a species, you mean? Or us in particular? Both. I laugh at this. His expression remains grave, and on his furrowed brow I can see where wrinkles are beginning to burgeon. I close my mouth. The sea will swallow us, he says, and in this moment, I'm glad. Thank you. I just, oh, I just love that. Thank you so much, Gracie, for sharing that story with us. And like I said in the comments, the um, Bay Area expat in me <laughs> appreciates the, um, the, the truth of Monterey. <laughs> um, the, just, oh my gosh, it's, I'm back. <laughs> Um, thank you, Gracie. <clears throat> Next up is Tierney Oberhammer, our uh, penultimate um, Vesnice scholar tonight. Tierney is a writer currently working on a collection of short stories and a novel. She is a member of the Wildcat Writing Group and an MFA candidate at Randolph College, where she was awarded a Blackburn Fellowship. Tierney's work has been published in Swamp Pink and Feministing, and she lives in Brooklyn, New York with Jamie and Wavy. Shout out. <laughs> uh, learn more about Tierney at tierneyoverhammer.com and learn about her because she's about to read. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Peter. I'm so excited. Everyone is so talented and accomplished and so happy to be here honoring Anthony. Um, I'm going to read the beginning of a story and then I'm going to skip and read the last couple paragraphs of it. Um, so sorry, spoiler. Um, but I wrote this story right after uh, Roe v. Wade was overturned last summer, so I guess just it has some stuff like that in it. Anyways, okay. A pregnancy test, a pack of condoms, and a box of tampons. Waiting in a long line at the pharmacy, Kaya can tell she's going to get her period any minute. Her breasts are tender, cramps come and go. She's 11 days late. For 11 days, she has anticipated a smudge of red every time she wipes. But her period had never been regular to begin with, so what does late even mean? Any second now, she'll start bleeding. She can tell. All signs point to yes. Yesterday, standing in her kitchen, Kaya felt a warm drip between her legs. She pulled her jeans down in front of the stove and grinned with relief upon seeing a spot of blood. After inserting a Tampax, she went about her day whistling. She achieved inbox zero, mopped the linoleum floor in her kitchen and made plans for a Saturday beach trip with a friend from work. Except later, when Kaya pulled the tampon out, it was dry, the cotton mostly white. The drop of red had been a red herring. Still, she can't be pregnant. She'd tried for years with Jonathan. Eventually, they'd gone to a fertility doctor. After four weeks of blood work and a test that involved shooting dye into the cavity of her uterus, some of which dribbled down her leg as she climbed off the examination table, the doctor informed the couple that it wasn't gonna happen without hormone injections and possibly IVF. Kaya accepted the news. Their efforts to start a family had been misguided anyway. It was a cliche, a baby to save a marriage. It might have worked, but it would have been a transference of pressure. While Kaya felt certain that Jonathan would have made a good father, he was helpful and kind and genuinely seemed to love her. She had been too hasty imagining a future with him. He was like water, ready to fill any vessel, no shape of his own, at least not that she could discern. So she put motherhood out of her mind. It was something she wanted, but only for the right reasons. Divorce at 32 humiliated Kaya, or rather it humiliated her mother who used the failed marriage to exemplify what she considered Kaya's poor decision-making skills. It marked Kaya as irresponsible in her mother, mother's eyes, though Kaya disagreed with this assessment. Kaya had graduated college, she worked to earn a living, and at least she'd undone her poor decision. A good divorce was better than a bad marriage, right? She'd apologized too. She knew her mother had taken time off to attend the wedding, had spent time getting to know Jonathan. Kaya felt bad. But now Kaya is meeting new people, making new friends, she started a job as the project manager for an experienced design firm. She loves puzzling together the different pieces, color coding spreadsheets and timelines. She helps decide what projects the firm will take on. A six, a six month long installation about saltwater symbiosis, for example. And the job has decent benefits. It's shaping up to be a good year. 
She painted the walls in her living room yellow after Jonathan moved out, and she finally has her weight under control. Cutting out sugar had worked wonders. Just days earlier, her mother wrote an email saying she was proud of Kaya. Looks like you're trying to make the most of your last good years. It had come as a surprise. No news is good news, her mother typically wrote in hastily punctuated emails responding to Kaya's check-ins about her well-being. Sometimes Kaya didn't get a reply for a week. Motherhood had not been part of her mother's plan, and so she cherished the return of a child-free life that came when Kaya left home. She taught watercolor lessons and kept busy with book club and her work at the animal shelter. But maybe now Kaya's mother was finally noticing Kaya's efforts, the little life she was creating for herself. A voice crackles over the store's intercom requesting assistance at checkout. Kaya glances backwards to see that the line is just as long behind her as it is in front of her. A recurring pain in her lower back returns and she shifts from one foot to the other. She tossed in bed all night and arrived at the pharmacy so early the staff was unlocking the doors. Now, standing in the checkout line, she feels self-conscious about the items in her basket, a pregnancy test, a pack of condoms, and a box of tampons. It looks like the setup for a joke, and it is funny, the trifecta of it all. A pregnancy test for peace of mind, condoms so she doesn't slip up again, and most importantly, tampons for her inevitable period. She had, ex she had sex exactly once in the past month and broke things off with the man shortly after. They first met online and exchanged messages for weeks through the app before they advanced hour-long phone calls about TV shows and current events during which Kaya folded laundry and carefully painted her nails. And although the man was overwhelmingly attractive when they finally met in real life, six foot four with dark skin dimples and a studded leather motorcycle jacket that he somehow pulled off behind a facade of charm and intellect, he was pushy and Kaya suspected had of the held values that did not align with hers. Over margaritas in Williamsburg, for example, he'd picked a fight with her about capital punishment of all things. Do you have any idea the taxpayer dollars going to prison lifers, he demanded. Kaya didn't, but she noticed that the man wore a gold cross and execution by the state didn't seem very Christian. She kept the thought to herself though. She wasn't religious anyway. Kaya believed in science. Overwhelmingly, the man made her feel sexy, desirable. She took the two train with him all the way to 177th Street. Once inside his apartment, she had no will of her own. Turn, he'd said leaning back on his pillows after undressing her. Come here. When Kaya hesitated, he'd added, now. Kaya had stepped toward him and struggled with how to hold her face, lips twisted as she tried to maintain composure. She giggled, apologized, and giggled again. Meanwhile, the man's expression remained serious, focused. Jonathan would have at least laughed along with her, she thought fleetingly. Not that it was fair to compare the two, Standing next to the CVS chewing gum display, Kaya can still picture the motorcycle's man's eyes tracking her as if casting a spell, and it, had and it had worked. It was a simple and straightforward seduction, and that was okay, wasn't it? She'd had fun, and more importantly, she was proud of herself for seeing early on red flags that she would have typically overlooked for months. The man was overconfident, controlling. He moved too fast, showering her with compliments and taking her hand in the street. With him, the pendulum swung as far away from Jonathan as possible. It was exhilarating, but at the same time, Kaya had felt that the man was performing a courtship. Sure, he made her heart thump in her chest, but she wasn't naive enough to mistake chauvinism for charm. Not after the first night, no matter how dashing the smile or firm the grip. In fact, she never wished to see him again. It was true that, caught up in the moment, she hadn't insisted on a condom, but when he'd asked where he should come, she pointed to her belly. Not that it mattered, she couldn't get pregnant even if she wanted to. The doctor had said almost exactly that. The checkout line moves forward a few feet and Kaya finds herself staring at an image of Jean Benet Ramsey. Kaya remembers seeing the same images in the checkout line at the supermarket when she was a kid. The girl's doll-like face and expectant blue eyes gazing at her from the magazine racks while her mom bagged their groceries. She's surprised the tabloids still cover the tragedy decades later. What exactly had the tragedy been anyway? Kaya had never really known. She gathered that the little girl died, but Kaya had been seven years old at the time. The fascinating part had not been the beauty queen's death, but rather how a child could look like that with those yellow curls and white skin, her little teeth and glossy red mouth fixed in a smile. So unlike Kaya and really unlike anyone she'd ever seen. 
Kaya understood that the little girl was considered beautiful, but the images made her feel unsettled. And the name, Jean Benet, it was a boy's name, wasn't it? It didn't seem like a name at all. Jean Benet's face was everywhere back then, hers and Princess Diana's, like mother and daughter, big blue eyes and a tiara. The headline claims that there is chilling new evidence in child abuse horror. Kaya takes out her phone and types Jean Benet Ramsey into the search bar. Jean Benet, a six year old pageant star, was found strangled in her basement on Christmas Day, 1996. Police found a ransom note addressed to the father, John Bennett, that experts described as unusually and therefore suspiciously long. For some time, the mother, Patsy, who had been crowned Miss West Virginia in her youth, was a suspect. Kaya reads that Patsy died at 49 of ovarian cancer. According to Wikipedia, she is buried next to Jean Benet in Georgia. Kaya notes that the child's full name, Jean Benet Patricia Ramsey, pays homage to both parents. She had nothing that was her, was her own. So now I'm gonna skip to the very end. Surprise, Kaya is pregnant uh, and she thinks about it for a while and then she gets an abortion. Kaya bleeds for a month. First large dark, clot, large dark clots that tear at her insides and then an easy bright red. It is a daily reminder. Sometimes she imagines holding a tiny baby, brushing her lips against its velvety sweet smelling head. It wouldn't have been unreasonable, given her age and station in life. It would have been an attractive child too, she feels certain of that. When the man with the leather motorcycle jacket texts her unexpectedly, hey sexy, she blocks his number. She has nothing to say to him and doesn't want to change her mind about having nothing to say. What good could come of it anyway? She is upset enough, as a, she is upset enough on her own. Except, once the bleeding stops, Kaya is surprised to find that she doesn't think about the pregnancy as often or as with much grief as she worried she might. It is not some great trauma. She's not Jean Benet. She's not Patricia. She's not her own mother. This story talks about her mother a lot too. Um, she's not a child. Her life goes on, neither too easy. Her life goes on, neither too difficult nor too easy. And she understands that soon it will be simply something that happened. A decision undone, a path doubled back. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tierney. There are so many moments in, in that um, that are so quotable. It's so like, it, it, uh, there are just moments of truth in that that I really appreciate for one. <clears throat> and I think everyone in the chat does too. <laughs> um, okay, moving right along. Our final uh, Janikian scholar, or, nope. <laughs> I knew I was gonna do it once tonight. Our final Vyas Nassau scholar um, is Maggie Sheffer, who is a writer and educator who lives in New Orleans, Louisiana. Her work has appeared or is forthcoming in Asimov's Science Fiction, The Dread Machine, Cast of Wonders, and The Pinch. Maggie is a founding member of Third Lantern Lit, a community writing collective, and volunteers at 826 New Orleans. She is a member of the Nautilus and Wildcat writing groups. Shout out to Wildcat, back-to-back <laughs> -back, yes, Nassau scholars. Uh, she has received her MFA from Randolph College. Shout out also to Randolph College. <laughs> uh, you can find her online at M. Len Shepherd. Uh, please welcome Maggie Shepherd. Thank you, Peter, and thank you to everyone at the Adroit Journal for this honor, and congrats to the other So scholars. It is so wonderful to be here with you and listen to your stories. Um, I am going to read the first two-thirds of this story, so to find out the ending, you'll have to check out issue 45 when it drops tomorrow. This is called Mouse Number Six. I roll my shoulders and touch my toes, getting limber in preparation for my death. When I die, I will bend my back and flop my arms, knock my knees and shiver my heels against the sticky floor so it can be seen from the back mezzanine. Let's be honest, Nutcracker is a ballet for children and children want to revel in my demise. It has to be so over the top, it goes beyond scary and back to funny again. I am double cast this year, my two biggest parts yet, Clara for the even nights and the Mouse King for the odd. Clara is the resume builder, a real pretty facey part, my blonde hair half up, my pale face made rosy with blush. I'm grateful for the opportunity, I say. These are our big money-making shows of the year. For two weeks in December, we get a live orchestra and whole families in shiny shoes. Kids gawp at the big crystal chandelier in the lobby when it winks at them during intermission. 
after 11 years of training, finally, there's a bigger than life poster of me as Clara in the red velvet lobby, cradling the Nutcracker doll to my chest. But on show nights, honestly, I relish the role of the Mouse King more. Rambunctious rapscallion is more fun to step into than Clara's little girl innocence. I exaggerate every gesture, play to the very back of the theater. From within my foam head and eye netting, the audience is a dark hearth, reduced to silence or tittering or cheers. I vamp. I'll do anything to make them laugh. I'll scurry, I'll tumble, I'll pounce. I lead my minions into the fray. My mice are local second to fourth graders bust here twice a week for cultural enrichment. The San Antonio Boys and Girls Club has partnered with our regional ballet company to deposit the kids someplace between 4 p.m. and 8 to keep them off the streets. The club provides the snacks, the transportation, and the additional supervision of Lara, the chaperone. Most of my company feigns exasperation at the mice, but it's invigorating how new all of this is to them. The velvet of the seats, the echo of the stage, the bright lights. With the kids around, the ballet is enchanting again and I am elevated from a tired 20-something into a wise ambassador. Lara, the chaperone, is hushing Rudy and Q, who are hitting each other with their long tails and making lightsaber noises. Q slices his tail into Rudy's neck, and Rudy clutches at his throat. He dies epically, just like I've taught them. A little gurgle, limp wrists and elbows, stumbling forward, lolling head. Lara grabs the boys by their mouse scruff and puts a heavy hand on each of their shoulders. We teaching artists are instructed not to touch the kids, but Lara always has a hand on them, tapping them on the thigh or grabbing their elbow to turn them around and direct their attention. Mostly she does the hand on the shoulder thing, like a safety belt. Like if she can just hold them in place for a moment, everything will gel. Their entire young slippery selves will solidify into something more sturdy and prominent. On stage, the Stahlbaum children are unwra unwrapping their elaborate living presence. Ballerinas unfold out of boxes, violins pace and swell in the background. Off stage beside me, my mice are illuminated by the upglow of their Nintendo switches, perched on costume trunks and scrunching their painted on eyebrows in concentration. I wish they'd watch the action on stage, enraptured. Still, Playing Smash Brothers on silent is better than when in dress rehearsals they dared to push each other on stage, their little half torsos momentarily sliced by the curtain and the sharp line of the house lights. We told the mice not to bother learning the choreography. Unlike the Stahlbaum children in their petticoats and the toy soldiers in their pantaloons, the mice did not have to audition. They are only here two days a week. That's our justification. As mice, they don't need to be practiced or precise. The more disorderly, the better. It's what people expect to see in their mice, their villains. We just say, mimic the mouse king, follow behind me, do as I do, slide when I slide, hop when I hop, stab when I stab. The audience finds their off-pace mimicry adorable. Children giggle, their parents guffaw. I worry about the unspoken, unpleasant racial dynamic that emerges with the mostly white Victorian children and my mostly black and Latino mice, but my crew relishes their mouseness and prefers their gray face paint over the foppish wigs. The dance lead offered a few of the more, more coordinated mice the chance to switch teams. The boys laughed. They shook their heads. They looked at each other like, what fools? The rest of the leads and I are all white, except for Tony, this year's Drosselmeyer, and in later acts, the nameless and shirtless Arabian doll. I don't imagine the ACLU is going to infiltrate us and come down hard on our regional ballet for discriminatory casting. I think it's good that we expose the kids to ballet, to the arts, any way we can. But it looks bad. It hangs in the air. Every night, the toy soldiers take arms against us, my mice and me. Every night we lose. Andres, mouse number six, hovers at the very edge of the wings, all of him twitchy with presence, wide with listening. He flickers his fingers like a phantom conductor. When tonight's Clara spins, he twists his shoulders in place so that his felt ears swirl about him. I know from earlier performances that Andres will stay in costume longer than the others, watching the rest of the ballet unfurl long after all the other mice have begun to sprawl and eat the goldfish packets and waxy red apples Lara hauls in. 
There's a lot of time to watch Andres, to watch the other dancers, to theorize. I mean, not a lot of time, a lot of moments, short spans when I am frozen in place backstage, already in costume, but not yet in character, when I can't do anything else because I've got minutes or seconds to entrance. So from the shadows, I watch my shiny, strong colleagues on stage, and for a second, I see it, the thing the audience sees, the thing I think Andre sees too, the glamour, the cocoon of the theater, the shield of it against all the daily bullshit, the enchantment of ill-fitting costumes, of the garish lights and stage makeup. It is a miracle, this thing that's brought us all together. The ballet is better than any of us with its powers of conjunction, of conjuration, of hypnotism. From all this human mess, something grand and majestic. Lara picks some fluff off of Q's ears. The kids do love Lara, I think. When they rush off stage, they whisper to her, did you see that? And she looks each of them in their eyes and says gravely, yes, of course I did. I was watching the whole time. Laura tells us things about the kids, salacious things, like their lives are her soap opera. She whispers, but the kids can obviously hear. They're right there. She whispers, of course Felix can't remember his cues. His brother was just deported. Or, you know Leroy's mother is in prison, so he gets distracted easily. Just show him one more time. I do not ask. It seems easier to let it lie, to let the mice abandon all that at the stage door and embrace being fully mouse and nothing else, a mouse among their own kind. That's what the ballet offers, the chance to sink into a temporary selflessness. Andres is running the edges of his costume, his ears, the hem of his gray fur shirt through his fingers. I get the sense he'd like to chew on his tail, but knows that would be childish. He keeps his costume tidy. No wrinkles. He must hang it when he gets home, rather than drop kick it into a corner. Even when I lead the mice in our most embarrassing warm-up exercise, the groin stretch, all spread and splayed barefoot on the glossy floor, Andres isn't one of the gigglers. 90 seconds to entrance. Lara helps the mice line up behind me. I breathe in and make myself larger and more wicked. I can feel Andres's breath against my wrist, a half step behind me, first in line. On stage, the Christmas tree has grown to immense heights. The tinsel and lights rise and rise to the rafters. It is our time, entrance. I run flat out to center stage. I do a cartwheel and my mice tumble roughly behind me. I wave my scimitar high. I pace the stage like I saw a leopard do once at a zoo, deadly softness in the paws. The toy soldiers take a knee and fire at us, but we twirl out of the way. We are the sly piccolos. They are the righteous trumpets. They advance, we retreat. After several volleys and early casualties on both sides, the music rises in volume, in pace, in shrillness. The Nutcracker and I circle the stage, circle each other tighter and tighter, looping into our inevitable final confrontation. I prepare myself to get stabbed, to feel the whiz of the wooden sword past my armpit. I hold still, arms in front of my face in mock defense and cowardice. My attacker never comes. I look to the nutcracker, who is still several paces away, bent in half, reaching down, grabbing at something. And I'll stop there. <laughs> mm, thank you, Maggie. I just adore the way, I mean, Gracie said it, it the, the way it's so graceful and fluid, like a ballet, meta. <laughs> Thank you, Maggie. Um, so our final reader this evening is Rochelle Hurt. Uh, Rochelle Hurt is a poet and essayist. She is the author of three poetry collections, The J Girls, a reality show from Indiana University Press in 2022, which won the Blue Light Books Prize from Indiana Review, in which I play the runway from Barrow Street in 2016, which won the Barrow Street Poetry Prize and The Rusted City, a novel and poems from White Pine in 2014. Her work has been included in Poetry Magazine and the Best New Poets Anthology, and she lives in Orlando, where she teaches in the MFA program at the University of Central Florida. Please welcome Rochelle Hurt. Thank you, Peter. Um, congratulations to all the scholars. Um, everybody who read tonight just blew me away. So thank you so much for your reading and I'm honored to be reading with you. Um, to pick up on the fish theme, I think there were fish in three or four pieces tonight. Um, I'm just gonna say that I'm a little bit of a fish out of water here because 
I'm a poet primarily, but um, I'm working on new pieces that are like lyrical nonfiction, flash nonfiction and prose poetry. So the piece in Adroit that I'm gonna read from tonight um, is sort of in that vein. Um, this is in response to a piece of visual art by um, Cecilia Vicuña, who you might know as a poet as well. Um, she's a visual artist. And I'm just gonna share my screen for a second so you can see the piece before I read this. Um, so this is um, the soft sculpture that the piece is in response to. Um, this is raw wool that's been dyed um, and then hung like this. Um, and when you see these pieces, she has a lot of pieces like this. And when you see them in person, they're really um, overwhelming uh, because they're huge. All right, I will stop sharing now. Okay, so um, this is called, this is just has the same title as the piece, uh, Cecilia Vicuña Kipu Wum, The Story of the Red Thread in Athens. The story of the red thread is a long one. You can stand in the middle of it and not see either end. In the red thread is a story of women. The minute you enter, blood overwhelms you. In the clots, a message. A kipu is an Incan recording device, knots like words arranged on a string, a poem in space, an account of tying one day to the next. The kipu, Vicuña says, must have been a female invention. It was Mama Oklo who rose from the water and taught Incan women to weave. And Clotho was the Greek fate who birthed the world from her spindle. You knit me together in my mother's womb, knit and soaked me in her blood. When Vicuña showed kipu menstrual, the thick red flows of wool offended some, and the curators asked her to thin it out. So she made an exhibit of the trimming. Hester Prynne was a talented seamstress. She wove trails of gold into her scarlet letter, fashioning the sin. There is a legend that says a red thread ties you to someone fate wants you to need. Slack and taut, slack and taut chained ankles or pulled pinkies. The knot between you can be anything, a rock bound to hit a girl in the head flung from her future husband's hand, or something simpler, cancer, school, hard-headedness. In her parents' back seat, A and I hooked pinkies. What rushes up the arm into the chest, blood in the ulnar artery, red filtered into blue beneath the skin. Later, she wrapped a red silk scarf around my wrist to cover the scabs. Three red lines stacked like a tally on top of the rest, pink and gummy. You shouldn't do this, she said. When the guillotine days were done, French aristocrats wore red ribbons around their necks, posh wounds or bratty invitations. In junior high, I wore chokers, but never made the connection. Is a red dress still red when there is no one to look at it? Gerta. Before I had cancer, I wasn't afraid of blood. In the hospital, needles pulled threads from my arm all night. One surgery left a scar across my throat like a white garroting wire. I have a picture of a 12-year-old girl from my hometown whose throat was slit by her boyfriend. In the picture, she's wearing a lacy black choker necklace. Time doesn't loop, it knots. Once the fates have spun your plot, no god can unravel it. In Angela Carter's The Bloody Chamber, the monster gives his bride a ruby necklace two inches wide, a collar to lead her into marriage into exile. If it's red, can it not suggest blood? Carter quotes Baudelaire. There is a striking resemblance between the act of love and the ministrations of a torturer, opined my husband's favorite poet. Ariadne gave Theseus a ball of red yarn and it led him to murder. P. 
Pinochet's caravan of death led Vicuña into exile nearly 50 years now. Conquistadors were noted sadists. The Pizarro brothers kidnapped and raped the Incan queen, Cura Oclo, and then had her tied to a stake, stoned and shot with arrows. They floated her corpse home down the Urubamba River, a win for the church and the Spanish throne. Flowing into the Urubamba further down is the Palkea Cupucamayu, a red river full of sandstone and iron. The girl from my hometown whose throat was slit died in a river that passes behind her home, six miles from her house to her death, but the river only flows in one direction. Red clouds over the Chilean sea, red song of sirens in the Aegean. Those studies on period sinking were faked, but we all know it happens, ask nuns or lesbians. Our bodies keep time in red rivulets. But the kipu remembers nothing. For weaving is passed through the memory of hands, Vicuña says. It passes through Vicuñas at four, knitting miniature sweaters in unknown ceremony. The story of the red thread in Athens is the story of the red thread in Cusco, through hands in the Andes, through hands in Greece. My mother's hands braiding my hair at night as I read her books on goddesses. Through stories of Pachamama and stories of Gaia, the clay were made from. I learned the earth has life because of its oceans, Gaia and Hydros, who together made Kronos. Time is born where water meets land, and this is where the story begins. Thanks. What a perfect ending line for this reading, seriously. Um, thank you so much, Rochelle. That was just absolutely gorgeous. Um, not a surprise since I've been a fan of your poetry for like ever. <laughs> um, so thank you so much to all of our readers. Um, everyone I has just surprised and delighted and inspired me in all of the ways. And um, I can't wait to write. I don't know about everybody else, but I'm very excited. I'm in the deep throes of thesis editing currently, finishing up my MFA. And this is what I needed. So thank you. Um, and um, and yeah, just a reminder, we are going to have the new issue online tomorrow morning. So wake up. Well, if you sleep in, then wake up and go check it. <laughs> Otherwise, check it around 10 a.m. But um, yeah, we are so excited to share this issue with you. You've had a taste of it here. Uh, if you were at our, our poetry reading last night, you had a taste of it there. Um, congratulations to our Vaisness of Scholars and um, go forth. <laughs> Thanks so much, everyone.